am Tanya Jenka, also known as She Hacks Purple, and I wrote a book, Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. And in the book are 11 different chapters, and at the end of each chapter, there's a bunch of questions that I put forth to the audience with the idea that um, I, I wanted to kind of spark conversation and talk more. And so I decided that, oh, hello, Kellen. Hi, welcome. Um, I decided that I thought the best way for me to try to teach as much as I could was to invite other really, really smart people on the stream instead of just having Tanya's opinion. What if we have a whole bunch of industry opinions? So each month of 2021, I'm having a stream, which you are at right now. <laughs> and so this week or this month, we have Aaron Lord on. So let's bring Aaron on. He is... Okay, Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself or should I do it? Because I'm more braggy than you are about you. You uh, introduce you, yourself I'll, and I'm going to add myself. on. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Aaron Lord. Uh, I've been uh, doing application security work for about 11 and a half years. I'm currently with uh, Vimeo <clears throat> uh, and I was just previously with Workday. Um, and I run uh, a blog with uh, my colleague, uh, Ray, that's uh, called Hella Secure Blog. And you can find it at uh, hella-secure.com. Uh, and apologies, there hasn't been a new uh, article in a while, but, you know, need inspiration, right? You know, but my uh, we're, I'm fairly active on Twitter and just uh, at Hella Secure on Twitter. <clears throat> And there's no dash on Twitter. So I'm just going to put that there. No. Hello, secure. And I'm just going to put it on the screen for just a second in case people all want to immediately follow Aaron. <laughs> just in case that you wanted to. I'm very subtle. Please. Aaron. <laughs> okay. So this, uh, this session is about chapter eight. And chapter eight is... I mean, I'm showing you on the screen, but it's securing modern applications and systems. So basically, a lot of stuff that that I've seen um, written on various things, they talk about legacy applications from a security perspective, and they're talking about SQL injection and how you have to validate inputs, which is true. But I found like a lot of the writings that I found or a lot of the stuff I saw, it wasn't like this is what you should do with APIs. This is what you should do with serverless. This is what, like, just like a high level, just give me a crash course I need to understand. I'm I'm considering going into the waters of serverless or orchestration and containers. Like, can you make sure I don't immediately step into the deep end and drown, please? Um, and so that's what I was trying to accomplish with this chapter, which is best practices for common stuff that's coming out right now. And uh, Aaron was so kind to accept my invitation to come and speak. For those of you who are aware, I run this company called We Hack Purple, and we have an academy. Uh, we have a podcast, which is on break right now, and then we have an online community. And Aaron's been really active in the community, sharing things he writes, comments, etc. And um, he is a valued member of the community of OWASP, of industry in general. And so he's like a bit, he's a bit modest, in my opinion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So um, Aaron and I were talking before this and we we're talking about kind of the ones we wanted because we can't we can't discuss the whole chapter. We'll be here for like four days. Um, and so we we're talking about kind of our favorite parts and we both wanted to cover APIs. So I was thinking, Aaron, if you wanted to talk a little bit about maybe like what APIs are and why maybe we should still secure them. Sure. I mean, uh the big thing with an API versus what we would probably consider a classic application or web application is that it's it's a uh, I mean it stands for application programmer programming interface but it sounds like and as you mentioned in, in your book is like it's not like an interface like I'm touching an interface yeah. right or like a development environment right it's basically a way yeah. for basically apps to talk to each other to get information that each one knows uh and they generally don't have a ui right it's it's only <clears throat> calling to the api requesting something and getting information back machine to machine talking um and i would say now more than ever it's even more important to secure apis 
just because of how prolific they are and how numerous they are. And not just the APIs themselves, but how the API ecosystem works. Yeah, I. this is going to sound like maybe it'll sound weird to you, Aaron, but like I, I have run into devs where um, these are new headphones and I don't understand how to use them yet. Um, <laughs> I, I run into devs where they don't think they're like, well, there's no GUI. So no one can see me. So why do I need to do security? Do you feel like, do you agree with that or? Um, in a sense, uh, I mean, probably 10 years ago or eight years ago. Yeah, that would definitely be way more common. Um, in a sense that it, it's the old adage of um, security through obscurity. Right, so it's like, you don't see me directly. You don't interact with me like a website. So they think that since it's kind of in the background doing mm -hmm. stuff that you don't uh, have to do as much security on it. Um, but we know that that's absolutely not true. Yeah, I so I was a pen tester for maybe like a year, year and a half, maybe a bit longer before I managed to figure out that AppSec was what I really wanted to do. And, uh, I remember in that time I took a, a mobile um, app pen test job. And so I go to the scope meeting. So they, they're they like, you know, this is the site. And so I just proxied it with burp on my phone for like just, you know, a couple seconds. And I, I wrote down the list of all the APIs for the meeting and kind of like, you know, like looked at what I could see without touching. Right. And then I went to the meeting and I was like, OK, so may I assume that all of these APIs are in scope? Like I wanted to check with you before I test them. And both the devs looked at each other and their eye. And this was like five years ago. And both their eyes just lit up. They're like, you can see those. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you're already hacking our stuff without permission. I was like, no, I just did like a little proxy and I could see the calls go back and forth. I didn't touch the calls. I just watched. Right. And. It's web traffic off of my phone. I'm allowed watching my own traffic, right? And they're just like, mm -hmm. how could she see? And then and then they're like, okay, so she's qualified. You can hire her. Hi, Stefan. Um, but it's like that that wasn't like to me, that was like just like a step of trying to sound organized in the meeting. Like I just wanted a list. I want per, like written permission before I touch anything, right? And so I want to name the things. And they're just like, oh wow. Do you, yeah. do you feel, sorry, do you, do you feel like, no, was, um, go ahead. No, oh, no, you go. I was just saying, I'm honestly surprised at that reaction too, because I mean, I don't They're, know, maybe just because I'm in my own bubble, I guess. Oh uh, yeah. Sometimes. Um, so here's the thing. I worked at the Canadian government for many years and that was sort of a bubble. And there are sort of things that I could always expect that would be true and things I could expect to be untrue. Like for instance, we're gonna have to write a lot of documentation or else heads will roll. <laughs> um, while in private industry, maybe they're not gonna do that in the same way or that, you know, I can only expect like this amount of security to be allowed or they're like, you know, no, you can't, you know, do this or that, that's too scary and new. And so then I went to work at Microsoft and they're, that is very different, like very cream of the crop, I would say, mm -hmm. like working with really highly engaged professionals who are super, 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 super passionate. They're like not there to get a pension. They are there to like change the industry sort of thing. And so each place you're at, like it's just such a different attitude. Like sometimes I would go in and do a pen test and I'm like, oh, are you you're going to school me? <laughs> right. Like each client has like such a different knowledge level. Um. And same with devs. And you don't know when you go in what you're going to get if you're a consultant. That's true. Yeah, because I haven't done that type of work of being a consultant or, or even working in uh, the public space. Uh, most uh, pretty much all of my uh, experiences with you know private tech companies. So I guess uh, I've been lucky that I've been able to work with a large number of like developers that are actually very security minded and tend to make my job not terrible. Um, but it's That's only a matter awesome. of time. We'll see. Uh, there are I mean, more than enough time in my career to run against craziness like that. So, so, so what would be some best practices maybe for securing an API? Like if we're, 
you know, there's a, a bunch of devs, we're going to meet with them. They're like, we're going to write an API. Can you like tell us how to make it not terrible? Do you have some suggestions maybe for them? Yeah, and it's funny because it makes me think of, I, I want to say the OWASP top 10, I think the last one, or the, maybe the one before that, where they wrapped up API security as its own line item in the top 10. And that kind of blew yeah. my mind because it's like that li line item alone is essentially all the other line items wrapped into one. Uh, yeah. Because at the end of the day, uh, APIs are vulnerable to all the same issues that any other application is vulnerable to just maybe in a different way, or you might yeah. execute it in a different way. The vectors might be a little bit different, but the weaknesses are still the same. Um, yeah. So you still have to do authentication to, to the API. You still have to authorize the user to do what they want to do. You still have to input and uh, input validate output and code. You know, you still have to do proper er uh, error uh, handling, logging, all the same stuff. Yes. So I think it was smart that I believe OWASP spun off an API top 10 into its own list because it, it, it's again different concerns but still most of the same weaknesses I'm just going to add that onto the screen so if you want to check out the OWASP top 10 project specifically for APIs so these are the top risks for APIs I just put the URL at the bottom but if you are listening to this only later just look up OWASP API top 10 and it'll be the top thing trust me or yeah. the second thing but probably the first thing because i basically just add a wasp to searches rather often and i get better results i don't mean to sound like a smart ass when i say that but it works yeah well also like the top five results in google are all ads now too yeah so ignore that <laughs> um Okay, so like other things that we wanted to talk about, like briefly, were the concept of DevSecOps and CI/CD, which are related but separate. Oh, Stefan! Stefan's saying really nice things. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, do you want to? I don't know. Do you want to briefly describe like what you feel or like what is? What is a CI/CD or what is DevSecOps? You can pick either one that you want. We can take team this. Yeah. So, I mean, I could start CI/CD stands for continuous integration and continuous uh, either continuous delivery, continuous deployment. It's kind of wrapped up into kind of one term, but it's pretty much is the pipeline that describes how developers write code and the steps it takes to be put into a deployment. So being able to actually take that code, build it and move it to a machine and host it and actually have it accessible and working. Uh, that technical process is what is known as CI CD. And there's a, a numerous amount of ways to, to, to define what that is. And that could be different per organization, right? And it should be really because that should also be tailored to what makes the most sense for that company, right? Um, it'd be really hard to kind of package that up and sell it as one product, which some companies yeah. have. Like GitLab is a really good example of that. They actually yeah. try to, I mean, they, they sell themselves on being a, a code repository like GitHub, but they've also built in all the tools into it to, to kind of solve a lot of those CI CD problems in one platform. I actually, I think like GitLab's doing looks really kind of amazing and awesome. And I'd really like a free license to try it all. <laughs> like it just looks like it's getting I, like. Yeah, I think there's a free community edition that you can download. Um, yeah. But obviously it's very, very, very limited. Um, yeah. Because in a lot of cases, the CI CD usually is at least a few different tools kind of like strung together. Right. So usually you start with like GitHub. You're able to actually push your code into GitHub, have it stored, have a version controlled. And then you have a build system like uh, Jenkins is probably the most popular one that actually takes that code, pulls it, does something with it, builds it, uh, might push it up to a, to a uh, like an artifact repository. But that's also mm -hmm. one of the key places where security can happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the SEC comes for DevSecOps. Right. Which I think maybe you could explain what DevOps is to kind of set that baseline. Okay. 
So long, long, long ago, when we started building software, we're like, if we want these projects to actually finish, we should have like a methodology, like steps that we follow to make sure that the project actually finishes and software gets launched. And so um, IT stole a lot of project management ideas from manufacturing, which is awesome because like manufacturing's existed way longer than IT. And so we at first did something called waterfall. And so when you build a building, you have to do waterfall, right? You have to define the requirements, be very clear, design it, and then build it. You can't just keep releasing new windows or doors or walls, right? Like that costs a fortune. It's not going to like really, um, that's not gonna go well with a building. And so for the longest time when we released software, most of us would do waterfall. That was the most popular, but around 70%, 65 to 70% of projects for software would fail, which is totally shocking. So then we came up with agile with the idea that like we could get feedback kind of faster and we could um, iterate on some ideas and cause software is literally soft. It's virtual, if that makes sense versus like hardware. Like if you build a circuit, and then you sell them to people over the planet, you can't be like, oh, here's another wire. Could you all just open it up and put it in? That's not going to go. But with software, you can. They're called updates. And I know they're annoying on your phone. And so, so then, you know, some really smart people were like, you know, manufacturing in an assembly line, they do a bunch of stuff where, you know, everyone does like their little part and we automate a bunch of stuff to make sure that things get out faster and we test them along the way, like regularly, so that we're building better products. And then if something is so bad, it doesn't pass the test, we stop the entire production line, yank it out, and then start it back up, which is a big deal if you're gonna stop a physical production line. It's a big deal, you do it when it's an emergency, but they have many checks over and over and over again, specifically to stop for that. And so some really smart IT people were like, what if we did that with software? And so at first they're like, let's integrate our stuff together all the time. So let's say Aaron and I are both coding the same project and he's doing certain parts and I'm doing certain parts. If we're both working separately and not talking to each other. And then after 10 weeks, we're like, let's put our code together. It's not going to work well because he, let's say named a variable this and I named it that and then it smashes together. It doesn't work. Or he thought it was a float and I thought it was an integer. We put it together. It doesn't work. But if we put our code together every day or even a few times a day, we would discover something like that immediately and be able to fix it very quickly because it's just a small thing. And that is called integration. When you put all the pieces together and make sure it works. And then they're like, what if we automated that? And what if we added tests, like automated tests that run every time to make sure those pieces still work? And so eventually they came out with software called CI CD with the idea that you check in your code, it puts it into the main branch. It makes sure the integration stuff works. It makes sure it does a bunch of tests. And then if it goes well, you can have it deploy to various environments and then you can do more tests. And the idea was, is rather than having some poor soul do manual QA testing every single time you release one line of code, no one's gonna tolerate that crap, but software does. And so over time they came up and ref like basically refined these processes into a methodology called DevOps. And it requires the dev and the ops team working together very closely. And as Aaron and I will probably tell you at nauseum, it means the security team needs to go along with their processes and go along with their way of doing things so that we can get security done at that same fast speed that they're going. And so that's what I like to call DevSecOps is like what Aaron and I, the security people are, are trying to help all of you do. So if you're doing your work in sprints, like two to three week time slots, that means we need to try to fit into that schedule. Or if you're using a CI CD, that means we might need to put some tests in that, but we might also need to learn to not put some tests in it that are slow and not super accurate because we don't want to make all of you really upset with us and break your nice processes. Do you want to add anything, Aaron? I'm like really excited about DevOps, obviously. <laughs> yeah, like the way the way I like to think about it is kind of like the DevOps and DevSecOps is kind of like, um, it's more uh, ephemeral, right? It's, it's not like a actual technology I can point to. It's like, it's process, it's procedure, and it's also the way you actually organize people. 
right? So organizing people in teams that are more cross-pollinated, uh, as you said, to <clears throat> break down silos and have shared responsibility where uh, dev works in, in a lot of cases, like in some, uh, in some companies, like in Amazon, development is DevOps. Like there is hardly any ops because everything just runs on AWS, even their internal stuff. So yeah. development is responsible for coding, spinning up the machines, deploying it, building it. They're responsible for the entire pipeline for themselves. So a team can basically do everything for themselves from beginning to end. Um, and I think a lot of organizations have really accepted the idea of DevOps, um, CI, CD, continuous integration and deployment. Um, getting the security in there in the middle is still gonna be, is still the challenge currently, right? And that's something I'm currently working on in my, in, uh, in my current organization where we're trying to make sure that we can kind of get fit stack in the middle to be able to actually kind of, again, uh, cross pollinate between those teams and actually try to make it so that, um, Again, we get that that what I like to call the the unicorn of you know actually having like real security automation, right? And in once upon a time, when I first even five six years ago, when I started learning about CI/CD, I hated it. I hated the idea of that because I was used to the model of like reviewing everything step by step and and taking the time to actually look at everything before I allow it to go out, right? So I was very used to that process. And it took me a while to realize, well, number one, <clears throat> I'm not gonna stop that train, right? That's gonna happen. So it becomes a matter of how does security work with what's going on and actually uh, fit into those processes and actually try to make change from within rather than from outside. I love that, Aaron. I love that idea. Like yeah, working directly with those teams, talking to them about what they're doing and being on the inside track rather than coming in from the outside and being like, you have to fill out this 80 page form before you can go to prod. And like, I'm going to receive that form and I'm just going to flick through it and just be like, no, looks bad. There's so many security teams that I have worked with. I'm like no one's going to fill out an 80 page thing. And they're like, well, they're not going to go to prod. And mm -hmm. I'm like, Yes, they are. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They're going to go behind your back because you can't just stop business because someone doesn't jump through a ridiculously unnecessary large hoop. Or that's my opinion and that's my experience. Yeah, yeah it's had to have been, uh, it's a paradigm shift uh, for like classic security people, right? To, to embrace that. And I, I, I know I have, and I like to think I have, um, but it's a case of where, uh, really effectively getting security into those processes is still something that is yes. eludes most companies. Um, yeah. And I think that also brings up the discussion of the, what Netflix termed the pave road, yeah. which I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely aware of is the case of where Netflix actually went through the uh, process of defining like the, the path to production is the most secure path and yes. straying from that is where we start to have problems right but if you can just follow that path and they can mm -hmm. define multiple paths and they can be branching as long as security has deemed these paths to be secure yeah. then there's almost no intervention intervention from security directly it's like you're, you're using process a b c d you're good to go but if you're going a b c f then we can then do something a little more manually yeah, then we need to talk. And it's not no, it's let's talk and find a way for you to like, do you need to do it that way? Okay, so then let's find a way for you to do it that way securely. Yeah, it's never a no. It's always a let's chat. Because um, at the end of the day, development and developers are graded and reviewed based on their, their ability to push features, right? So any impotence of that is gives you, makes it more likely to be ignored, you know, because they're not getting paid and evaluated a lot of the times for not pushing features. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Well, and if your boss is like this, these three bugs need to be fixed by Friday and this feature needs to come out Friday. And then the security person's like, I found 43 things wrong. 
you're like, guess what, security person? You don't sign my paychecks. My boss does. <laughs> and so yeah. if my boss is not down for that or willing to change my schedule and I don't have time, then tough. It's like a conflict of interest almost. Yeah, it's uh, that's also very important to actually have the right people in the right levels of an organization, right? So if you have security people too low on the rung, they can't really effectively push change and push policy and push that uh, what they would like to do. So it's always important to have someone that's at that chief staff level that is able to kind of work from the top down or in the interest of security. So a person wrote a really great article about creating your own paved roads. Oh, and it was you, Aaron. So I, I put did. the link, <laughs> I put the link at the bottom. So there's a Hello Secure article about creating your own paved roads. And uh, I just thought I would let people know that are listening. If you go to Hella, so H-E-L-L-A dash secure.com, one of the articles is about how to create your own paved roads. And I actually really liked that article. That's actually how I got to know Aaron. So I met Ray, who also writes for Hello Secure. And then he's like, well, Aaron's really awesome too. You should probably know him. And I was like, ooh. So obviously being who I am, I read all of his blog posts first and then wanted to say hi. I'm like, ooh, I agree with all the things he's writing. I got to meet this person. Um, Awesome. It, it's it's awesome to read someone else's work and be like, I completely agree. Because I have to tell you, Aaron, sometimes I read articles and I'm like, no. <laughs> like quite often I read articles. I'm like, that's awful. No, you should not do that. That No, that's not that. No. <laughs> so no. I. Uh... <laughs> oh. OK, so there was one other thing that we wanted to touch upon that I, I want. Well, that I want to touch upon. And that's the difference between paths. So platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. And so this has come up a bunch of times and I just wanted to briefly mention it. So in the book I cover, you know, platform as a service is basically a cloud offering where you give them either a Docker container or some code and then they just run it for you. So they just run the infrastructure for you. They patch the infrastructure for you. They secure the infrastructure for you. And you just have like a couple of configuration choices like you can force HTTPS, which I suggest you do. And there's just a couple of things, but basically they care for and feed your platform as a service for you. And you're, you just need to update your app and make sure your app itself is secure. Well, then infrastructure as a service is, you know, you ask GCP, AWS, Azure, Heroku, whatever, and you say, oh, I want a Linux box and I want to be like Debian, let's say, and or whatever it is that you desire Red Hat, blah, blah, blah. You're like, I want it to be this, and I want it to be the latest version, um, and you know, I want it to be this big, I want to have that much power, memory, et cetera. And then they build you a virtual machine that's like that. And what they will do is give you a very nicely patched, like well-configured virtual machine. And then you would need to harden it further, usually. Like I would apply whatever policies where you work. And then you have to care and feed for you have to care and feed that virtual machine from then on. So Microsoft, um, Google, AWS, sale, whoever it is, they're like hands off. They're like, it's yours now to take care of. And so I've seen devs, um, not really devs usually, usually like older, like people that are newer to the cloud where they say, oh, it's a shared responsibility. So the vendor has to patch those things. And it's just really important. And I want to just specify and clarify this like I did in the book and like I have a, a million times when I've given talks. So like PaaS, they will secure and, and patch it for you as long as you take care of those few configuration items that they give you. And you probably want to get your own certificate for it so that you can use a custom domain, stuff like that, but they will patch it. They will take care of it. But if you have infrastructure as a service, they will not. It is your problem. And so you should take care of that. And I've just seen it where they're like, oh, but it's in the cloud, so it's fine. I'm like, I do you, have you had any weird experiences with the shared responsibility model in the cloud? Like where people thought the cloud provider was taking care of something and they weren't and then disaster ensued? I mean, well, look at the most classic example of like uh, online storage, right? So using, uh, 
S3 buckets or other types of online file storage for apps to, um, to, to use those files for whatever they need it for. But then they forget to make sure that the bucket is not just publicly exposed and to the internet, right? So it's supposed to be a private bucket with files that is supposed to be only be used for their production infrastructure. But then the bucket itself, they forget to turn just one toggle private to public. And then that creates a URL that's publicly accessible to all those files. Uh, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest examples of that in the last like four or five years. Yeah. And, and then they're, and then the customer feels betrayed. They're like, but, but, but and it, it's like, if you're going to use a cloud provider, you really need to check out what the shared responsibility model is for that cloud provider and make sure you're doing your half so that you're safe. Mm -hmm. Right? Like yep. I just don't, I don't want people to get into bad situations like that. I mean, that's why we both write security stuff all the time because we really want us to do better. Um, Gary from the chat has, so Gary always has awesome comments. Um, so mm -hmm. his comment is, isn't this cultural part of DevSecOps? So like the devs need to feel responsibility for security and security people need to realize that they are there to help the whole company meet its goals. And then he's added up, I've seen devs want to build their own Kates or um, Kubernetes clusters on top of Linux VMs instead of a PaaS orchestration option because they want to control it. So it's kind of like a second topic mm -hmm. from Gary, but I like, I get wanting to have control over your systems, but control means responsibility. And so if you want to build, you know, a Kubernetes cluster on top of a Linux VM, then you need to care for and love that Linux VM yourself. It's your responsibility. Just like I have a garden and if I go on a trip and I can't water it, I have to get someone to water it for me while I'm away or I come back and everything's dead. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. disappointing. I had that happen once because my plant sitter was a plant murderer. And by that, I mean, she watered them two times every day until they all drowned and everything was covered in mold. But anyway, <laughs> but the point is, it's like you have to entrust your systems that you are caring for to someone that is trustworthy, who I guess has a green thumb instead of a black thumb in this case, or someone that is going to actually patch it and actually take care of it and actually monitor it and actually log. And if you just throw it off to a team and you know they don't know what they're doing, like you're setting yourself up for some serious disappointment. Um, yeah, that's especially, it comes also back to the question of like, how much should you reuse uh, either tools or libraries that are like better to do security than you may be able to do for yourself, right? So being uh, an example of writing your own authentication portal where you could have just used a third party that has already been proven to do it well, like using if you again, if you're using AWS or Azure, just using their authentication portals that they yeah. offer, uh, or yeah. uh, it, or another third party uh, service. Like, yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Okta as well. Yeah. If you don't have the people in place that have the knowledge to actually support these things all the time, then you really have to think about what are the better options for yeah. like, leaning on somebody with note that has done has created it and made it proven that it, it works well that to use that instead but then that also comes in the question is like even if you use these things sometimes you have to configure it right as well you know yes. because there's been so yes. many times that sure you can just spin up a bunch of boxes in uh elastic computing right in aws but then if you don't set the security groups right it makes it also publicly accessible or something or like it uh security groups or the permissions and the firewalls are too big like they can provide these tools for you but you still have to like configure them correctly follow the hardening guide folks mm -hmm. it sounds so so we um on the we hack purple podcast we had um a pen tester on and one of the audience members said so if someone followed the hardening guides and then patched regularly she's like oh i wouldn't have a job <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I wouldn't have a job then. I get in because you don't follow the best practices of good security hygiene. And so part of what I like about DevOps is because things get released faster and because you've automated tests, it means that it's way easier to release things. Is that 
that means it's easier to do just general good hygiene of patching because like I worked at a place once and I kid you, I kid you not, Aaron, they had a 16 month release cycle. So if I wanted a change to the code, it would take 16 months to get it into production. And an emergency fix was four months, like emergency, everything's burning down. It's the end of the world. And I was like, no. Oh, and here is the podcast episode because our amazing sound engineer just put it in. So that was Meryl Vernon, who was like pretty awesome. Was like, she was kind of a badass. <laughs> she was like pretty amazing. But she's like, yeah, if everyone just followed all the best practices and patched regularly, you wouldn't need me. And that like, it sounds weird, like I kind of knew that, but having someone just say it really blatantly, like if all of you just did that, you wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. And I dream of the day, Aaron. <laughs> I dream of the day where they're like, Tanya, Aaron, yeah. you can go back to being devs because everyone knows security now and we don't need you to do AppSec. Yeah, essentially. Like it, it probably even get to a point where, uh, especially, not all of security, but probably, especially for application security that we'd be rolled up into just standard dev teams uh, oh, yeah. and just have our security knowledge be that be. The problem is you also have to be, new people are coming into the industry every day, right? So they also are not getting the proper security education that they're getting in school of the oh, yeah. issues that you d probably don't even realize until you actually start working and actually experiencing what it is to actually like write production code uh, and all the hoops that you sometimes have to go through. Uh, and I think it's solvable, right? <clears throat> but it could take a while, especially if it's not something that's kind of like outside of the hands of the actual tech sector. Like this is now we're talking about the education sector to like try yeah. to like prepare people for this, right? I have a lot of gripes about the education sector, but I'm actually in talks with a university right now about potentially becoming an adjunct professor. And like, like it just, it, yeah, that's cool. Universities awesome. have zillions of dollars and then they pay adjunct professors, nothing, but this one, it's like actually reasonable. And I'm like, Ooh, mm. <laughs> um, it's right. not minimum wage. It's actually like decent pay. Like not yeah. like if I was a professor at science, it's way less than mm. that, but it's reasonable. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But like, that's why I started these series, Aaron, because I wanted this education to be accessible. And I know that like this conversation between us is probably not the most perfect learning method for every single person on the planet. But I personally have learned a lot from these sessions from all the other professionals that I've brought in and just being able to talk openly and discuss like real security things that happen every day. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, real Aaron, quick, and I, I completely yeah. agree with Gary's comment about the cultural part of DESEC. It's a huge culture shift if it's not already there. Uh, and again, but that's also something that has to be a top-down experience, right? So the, the uh, upper leadership has to really want to make sure that to instill that into a organization to allow the you know contributors like myself to actually take advantage of that culture, that new culture, right? So that's definitely an initiative. That before a company that isn't doing DevSecOps normally, that's one of the first things I have to think about, right? Is how do we present this now to the organization in a way to shift their thinking? I agree. Let's do some questions. So for those who have never been to one of these sessions before, at the end of each chapter, there's a bunch of questions. And I have a little answer key at the back of the book, but I wrote it and I'm telling you, it's just, it's it's the minimalistic answers that I could give because a lot of these questions are huge. They could be an essay, they could be a big open discussion. And that's why I wanted to hold these sessions. It also involves like a lot of opinion an experience to answer some of these questions. And so while I want people that read the book to answer these questions for themselves, I was hoping to have these sessions so that you could have many opinions and different ways of explaining these answers to these giant questions so that you could have varied, uh, varied opinions. So not just Tanya's opinion, lots of people's opinions. Um, but also to help you shape your own opinion, because your opinion doesn't have to be exactly mine or Aaron's. It'll go with all the experiences that you've had, 
plus the information we share with you in each of these sessions and everything else that you consume. And so I was hoping, Aaron, we could go through some of the questions, maybe all of them, and then, <laughs> and then we would say goodbye and you would promote anything you want to promote. And I guess I would too. And how's that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and we will go in between one of the questions to answer it. Sometimes we make an explanation and we say an acronym or we skip over something. You're like, excuse me, just let us know if you need more information. Okay, so the first question is what does the term shared responsibility mean? And I feel like we kind of covered it. Some, oh, thank you. Uh, my amazing sound engineer put it on the screen for us. Aaron, do you do you want to briefly describe this or do you want me to do this one? I was kind of thinking I would do. Oh man, I already answered some of these. <laughs> Shared responsibility yeah. means, yeah. Do you want to do it? Yeah, to me it means, again, it's breaking down silos, right? Uh, because in the classic um, tech world, you, you would have your development team, your operations team, and security team, right? And sometimes the only way they talk to each other is through tickets, and like that's it. Uh, what it is is breaking down the silos again to, to uh, increase collaboration, cro create co cross pollination to actually be able to make it so that we can talk to each other and understand each other's like what we're mm -hmm. doing. So that we can actually come up with more creative solutions on how we can try to make this uh, the entire experience more secure, more innovative, and uh, and have greater uptime, especially for people who are in ops who are always worried about uptime and stability yeah. and that kind of stuff, right? So it's the days of like development, architecture, and security working on their own with no with barely any communication with each other is it's it's becoming a thing of the past. It's not completely gone, uh, but we're I think we're headed in a good direction. Yes. I also want to add to that. When we talk about cloud providers and we talk about shared responsibility, there's going to be a document that you need to read about which parts your cloud provider is going to handle for you and which parts you must do. And a lot of it has to do with security. And so if you are a security professional and you work somewhere and they are using cloud, doesn't matter which cloud you're using, some of the cloud security responsibility is yours and some is theirs. And you need to read that document and know it so that you do not mess up. There's an awesome question in the chat from Gary. As per usual, awesome questions from Gary. So he said, thoughts on mandating open API specs to ensure you at least know the scope of the API attack service. I am a huge fan, Gary, of setting standards of what you expect to see in your organization. Um, I usually don't go around naming a ton of products because I don't know. I just don't, I don't want to have favoritism. I don't want to have like other companies get all upset with me. But that said, I'm going to name some products. Um, so there's a product by this lady named Isabel called 42 Crunch. And it's, it's great for this. There's an, a, an IDE plugin that's free for like Eclipse and VS Code. And I can't remember the other one all of a sudden, but basically you plug it in and it will look at your API, your open API definition file. So sometimes called a Swagger file, it used to be called Swagger. And it will tell you, you haven't set a minimum for this. You haven't set a maximum for this. You haven't set a data type for this. You haven't, where's your authentication? Where's this, where's that? And it makes sure you fully define your open API definition. And if you fully define, especially limits, and types and basically validate the data that you're getting, uh, your life's going to be a lot better. And so I've worked with one organization where it's like, yeah, basically like we're going to plug this in. And if you're missing parts of your definition, then your API is not done yet. Let me know when it's done. And the tool will just like kind of be like, you know, the red squiggly lines when you've misspelled something in a Microsoft Word document, it's like that, but in your code. And I personally have found that really helpful. So giving them a list of best practices, like for instance, if your API is publicly accessible, it has to be, you know, it has to go through, let's say Kong, an API gateway, and you just otherwise know, nothing else is allowed to connect to it unless it comes through Kong, the end, right? And so if you set up requirements, 
then you're going to get a better product at the end versus if you're like, go forth and do whatever you want, devs. And then at the end, you're like, bad dev. You didn't do the way that it is in my mind that I didn't tell you about. Um, I've seen a lot of that in my time. What do, what do you, do you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, I haven't worked directly with open API, but I'm definitely uh, down for more of that type of like technical definition where, mm -hmm. uh, and this is especially true when we talk about um, dynamic stack analysis and against APIs because dynamic stack analysis or excuse me, dynamic application, application security, security testing, testing. DAST is one of the main things it tries to do is especially against a web application that tries to spider it, right? So spidering meaning it goes to page one, follows all the links, goes to those pages, follows all those links, follows it goes to a form post, goes submits a form post and just basically tries to map out the entire web app. Mm -hmm. Again, APIs don't generally have a front end. So it doesn't know what to look for. Like it doesn't know the endpoints. Uh, it doesn't know like just from looking at a black box perspective against an API, the DAS tool doesn't know what to test, what uh, paths to test for, what parameters to test for, and what's expecting back. And the only way you can actually have that occur to do dynamic testing against APIs is you have to have these types of definitions somewhere that it can reference. And it can either be open API spec or there's a couple other specs uh, like uh, soap. What was, soap. Yeah, some of those that they're <laughs> underutilized a lot very very underutilized and i think also in a lot of cases that once you actually create these i believe they also auto spin off documentation oh yeah yeah the open api is actually quite a pleasure compared to previously when i had to work in soap with xml i thought mm. I, I don't know about you but like i was just like it was like a breath of fresh air like even just looking at the open api definition file it's i don't know if you've seen one it's actually beautiful it's like different colors for different types of um HTTP methods and it's like you can fold it and then open it up so it's really easy to look at it. And yeah, if your definition file is incomplete, then the DAST is lost. You're giving them an incomplete map and you're like, why can't you get there, you dumb tool? And it's like, well. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's also uh, security scanning for those definitions as well, like scanning open API files oh, yes. to look for things yes. as well. And then, yeah. um, and I believe SOAP it was XML, right? Yeah. Yeah. So any way, anytime you can get away from XML to anything else, it's a win in my, in yeah. my book. Me too. Um, <laughs> okay. So you talked briefly already about, so we're just doing another question. Um, thanks for the awesome question, Gary. But you already talked about online storage a bit, but like why, Aaron, is there more or is there not like more or less risk to online storage versus just storing it in your own data center? And which of the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability could apply to online storage? Yeah, I mean, well, anytime we're gonna be using a cloud provider, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? So it's like, they take on a lot of the low level risk when it comes to the actual hardware and the servers and all the really like kind of a bottom level uh, risk when it comes to those things. But you're also implicitly granting more or less access to this data to the cloud provider. And I'm sure they have, you know, ways to make sure that, you know, the cloud provider doesn't actually have access to your data right they make it so that they can't yeah. see it for themselves right yeah, but you never that. you never you never 100 percent know right uh, they can only tell you what's what's true from their perspective uh and when it yeah. comes to the, the triad i mean it's all of them right because you want to keep the confidential you want to have it available because you, know, you don't want a system to go down and you also don't want it to be tampered with so you also don't want the integrity of the data to be, to be uh you know tampered with yeah exactly so it's all of them like there's a risk to all of them i feel like you already answered the next question without realizing it like the next question was name one new risk that the cloud has that a traditional data center on premises data center doesn't have and that's all the employees that work for the vendor mm -hmm. right yeah that's and, my exact answer to that too was <laughs> yeah. that now there's insider threat 
for the cloud provider as well, not just your own. And your own company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, multi-tenancy. So when there's a cloud provider, you know, AWS, apparently I'm not their only customer. Apparently they have more customers. What? And the, all those one? customers, right? I've heard they have at least five. And all of those different customers are all in the cloud. Like wherever your stuff is and whatever data center that they have, there's lots of other people there. And what if one of them tries to escape and get into other areas? And that's like another risk. Now, is it super likely? It's it's low. They know about it. They work hard at it, but it's a possibility. Oh, I'm just gonna close my door because a gigantic truck decided that it would park mm -hmm. in front of my place. Um, that that's super super true, and I think that for every uh, cloud provider, that's probably their number one concern is to ensure the uh, again the integrity of the customers like being separate from each other because again they're running not only on the same hardware but they're also running on the same probably the virtual machine that it's running uh mm -hmm. so they have to have physical separation logical separation and separation in the, in the code through permissions you know so there's just layers on layers on layers when it comes to who can access what yes um so the next question is, uh, there we go. What is the difference between a container, a virtual machine, and a physical server? Shall I take this one? Please. So we, long, long ago, <laughs> I like to tell stories. Long, long ago, we had physical servers. And so I remember working in a place and I had, this giant test bed and I had 17 servers and I had to patch them and care for them, configure them, put them on the network. And each one ran one operating system and I did interoperability testing and I'd have my stuff do all of its stuff. And I had a whole bunch of clients that I had to, and all of that. And then I'd run it through an SSL accelerator because when I was 21, that's what I was working on. And I had to care for all those different machines. But then eventually some really smart humans were like, well, what if, you know, we have these giant, huge, powerful machines. What if we virtualize the operating system? So there's like a core part that then can run virtual machines. And each one of them has an operating system, like a full version of Windows, a full version of Linux, whatever you're running. And then you could have an app live in there. And like, if you had a big server, you could run like four virtual machines on it maybe, or maybe even more. And so that was awesome because you could get way more out of one machine and you could share some of the resources and stuff. And, and it was cool because you could do more with less. Then some really smart people said, why do I need the entire operating system for Windows? Can't I just have the pieces I need to run my little app? Can't I just, you know, I don't need, <laughs> you know, when you install Windows Server, it's like two gigs of hard drive space and two gigs of memory minimum to turn that on. And so, yeah, I don't need all of that. My little app just does this, this, and this. So containers are just the part of the operating system that you need to run your app. It, it's So it might be two megs or four megs instead of gigs. And that meant that you could have one physical server or multiple servers all interconnected together, at, like networked together. And then you could have tons of containers running. And then it turned out running tons of containers is hard to manage having hundreds of things and you have an instance of this and an instance of that and your containers are all over the place. So then they invented orchestration. And so Kubernetes is the most well-known one and that's fine. And basically um, you would like, it will turn on the container, turn off the container, give it more memory, secure it, et cetera, and do all these things. And so the orchestration runs all the containers that might be flowing across many different physical servers. And so those are the differences. And it's sort of like a history lesson of tech, of infrastructure, of how things have changed. And I have to say, I have only played with Kubernetes once and it's really complex and hard. <laughs> and it's, it's very doable, but I mean, I'm not an ops person, I'm a dev person. And so I lean on my dev friends or my ops friends to do that side of things whenever possible. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, and Gary adds, 
The difference is that containers are cool now. VMs were cool 10 years ago and dedicated servers were cool 20 years ago. Oh my gosh, she's so right. As per usual, Gary it has always, the best answer. Um, it always reminds me of this meme too about containers like that meme with the child on the the child and the guy on the bench it's like from a movie after your twin it is the child's oh, like yeah. crying he's like you say it works on my machine and the adults live then we'll ship your machine and then at the bottom it says and that's how doctor was born i know i love that i would love to have like a poster but, of that it's so funny <laughs> and it's funny because i you know it's funny and i also also used to poo poo docker as well I'm like oh what is this new i'm yelling old man yells at cloud but uh, after working with Docker the last few years, I love Docker. Docker's awesome. Uh, it's so awesome. Just be like, and the cool thing is you can define everything you need for your Docker container in code. So you can actually have it versionized. So you can actually say, Docker, I want this image. Do these things when it, when it spins up. Deploy my code on it. And then you just, and then but of course you then run into the problem with orchestration as you already said about but at least in my Eric, case i'm just i'm writing like one security tool that runs on one ecs in aws and that's all i have to worry about so i'm i'm cool with it just by itself aaron totally just answered the next question in advance as he is wont to do so the next question was name one advantage of infrastructure as code and so he just he just answered one i i would add mm -hmm. too that if you're gonna put everything in code, another advantage is that then you can save it into a code repository and then you can have version control. And so that means if Tanya came in on the weekend and added a bunch of stuff and then pushed it to prod and on Monday, Aaron's like, no, actually that's really not working. He can roll back to the previous version and release that infrastructure instead. And we have a perfect copy of every single thing. And it documents all your changes for you. And you know, Tanya made that change versus Aaron. And Aaron's like, oh my God, Tanya, what have you done? And so then he could see my name checking it in. And that's helpful too. And I can put comments about what I'm fixing. And it keeps track of that too. I love version control. It really helps. I feel yeah, like and we, yeah, sorry. I only got even introduced to Terraform maybe a few years ago, like three years ago. And again, I was like, what is this? Uh, but then I used it and I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, and again, it not only gives you, like, like you said, the ability to kind of like uh, have roll, even more uh, efficient rollback procedures, but it makes deployment, uh, deployment can actually be defined by a team other than ops. And it makes every single deployment incredibly predictable. Uh, and you won't have like again that one sys engineer or ops guy that's just going to be like oh, I'm tweaking this one machine over here, and they make a command wrong. Like it removes, it helps to remove the human error element from actual system infrastructure. Um, and uh, yeah, like I, again, I'm a fan. It, it also makes it so that that infrastructure as code now goes through the same pipelines as all the other code, the CI, CD pipeline. So any security gates that you can put in that process can also account for the infrastructure's code. So you can run, uh, especially for Terraform, and if you don't know what Terraform is, it's you basically define what your cloud infrastructure is going to look like via code. And it builds uh, it. And it just makes it, right? And then you get, it can predict also what the changes will be because before you can apply it, you have to plan it. So you do Terraform plan, and it'll show you a list of what's going to change and say, for example, your AWS, and then you hit plan, and then just does it. And it just does whatever AWS commands it needs to do for you to make those changes. But then you can also run infrastructure security tools. So like Terraform has a tool called TFSEC. And if you run that, mm -hmm. it'll scan the Terraform for some of the things I mentioned before, like overly broad security groups, uh, mm -hmm. no key rotation in your encryption keys, uh, open S3 buckets, overly permissible uh, IAM roles or the ident identity management roles. Like it mm -hmm. checks all that stuff for you. Yeah, it's awesome. And there's a, like a lot of tools that have come out um, that will let you set 
a policy. So let's say, you know, Terraform's like, this is what we think you should do. But then your security team's like, actually, we also want, like, we want to be more strict. And so this, this, and this are required. And then you can have tools scan and it'll say, oh, you know, this piece of infrastructure is not meeting our policy. So we need you to add this and this so that you can comply. Sorry. Right. It just, and then Gary added, you know, your Docker files, your Kubernetes config files, et cetera, can be scanned by software composition analysis tools, which will look at all of your dependencies and tell you if there's known vulnerabilities in any of them, which again is stuff that you couldn't do unless it was infrastructure as code. Like if you're putting a virtual machine through this, it can scan it and tell you that patches are missing, but there's no, I don't believe that there's an SA, SCA, software composition analysis tool that is for like a virtual machine. It, I believe it needs to be infrastructure as code or a container for that to work. I, like I think there is, but it has to run on the machine itself. So it has oh. to already be pre-installed and, and executed. Yeah. And Kellen was adding, like, if you take all that infrastructure as code and you're keeping it um, in your uh, code repository, this helps with business continuity. So if, everything has fallen apart, you would be able, if you have backups of your code repository and your CI CD pipeline, you need to back that up. Um, then what you can do is you can actually like re-release all of your infrastructure very quickly if something really awful happens. And I think like sometimes devs kind of forget that business continuity applies to them too. And like having your CI CD pipeline, having your infrastructure as code, all of it backed up really nicely into a repository somewhere means you well yeah if ransomware somehow hit your stuff it's like well we can re-release those things i mean it's not the whole business continuity plan but it certainly helps okay i have more questions aaron serious time now what's one advantage of devops over waterfall I think for me is, um, again, it's increasing collaboration and shrinking of silos, um, mm -hmm. but it also helps to drive more innovation. Uh, and the biggest thing, this is probably the biggest epiphany I had probably the last few years with CICD, is that mm -hmm. it greatly reduces your uh, MTTR, which is means mean time to remediate meaning how fast can you say a vulnerability that gets discovered if you run a hacker one program someone finds a, a bad vulnerability instead of having now in a waterfall structure if you have a two or three week sprint it could take i mean possibly they can okay. do an they can do an emergency patch but a lot of times they have this model where they have to go through this like at least like a week uh planning meeting to do all the stuff to just get one patch out but if you have all this entire process automated and again they're following the paved road they can mm -hmm. make the patch and have it build and deployed potentially within hours right so instead of having these like gaps there's like a graph where it's like kind of uh again the mean time to remediate instead of having kind of like a big staircase where it's like a like a large when you go up means more time that you're vulnerable and then you fix it instead of being mm -hmm. more time going vertically you have more time to just go small stairs right so you're basically yeah. reducing the amount of time that the vulnerability is present once you know about it yes that so makes it yeah that's huge i just yeah no it it is it's the best i also like the idea of like the fact that it makes it easier to get accurate feedback way faster to all the teams. So like as a pen tester, I would come in right at the very end of the secure system development life cycle. And it would be just like real, like I'd be the first person to look at security. The devs thought everything was fine. But when you're doing DevOps, I could put some security tests in right near the beginning. Right. Like I could run a software composition analysis tool and tell them, like, listen, re releasing that in .NET version three, mm, not great. Could you <laughs> could you use a newer framework or whatever? And it's easier for them to change that at the beginning than the end of the project. Right. And so like all 
when they're releasing things more often, then that means I can tell them I've found something that's disconcerting. Can we talk about it and change it way earlier in the process, way faster? And so that means it's not like they're building more and more on top of this thing, thinking it's fine. And then I come in at the end as the pen tester and just like deliver lots of bad news. Instead, I'm at the very beginning saying like, hey, like my desk scanner found this thing that looks pretty disconcerting. Could we like change that around now? And I mean, there's been lots of studies done about the earlier you fix a bug, security bug, any type of bug or a design flaw in the system development lifecycle, the less money it costs, but it's also easier. And it also means that it's less stressful for devs. I've been the dev where they're like, could you fix these 26 things before Friday? Because we just had a pen test done, okay? And that sucks. It sucks to be that dev, <laughs> it really does. Or like, I'll be the team lead of the devs and they're all like looking at each other like, I kind of had weekend plans because I have a life outside work. Like, why are you telling me this now? This project was eight months. Why are you telling it to me like four days to go? Um, yeah, there is um, a question in the chat that I really liked from Rami. Can you reverse engineer an existing infrastructure into a Terraform infrastructure's code file? Rami, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. I've actually never used Terraform. I've attended some workshops on it, but like I've never like run stuff in production. Does anyone in the chat know the, or Aaron, do you know the answer to this? I have no idea. Uh, well, it looks like there is a Google Cloud platform in the next mess, uh, chat message there, oh, okay. Terraformer. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah there, so there are definitely some tools that can do that for you. That's from Nancy. So Nancy knows the answer, but mm -hmm. I don't. Nancy's awesome in case you didn't know. <laughs> Okay, so we have just a few questions left. Um, so one of the, so in um, like near the end of the chapter, which we did not talk about yet on the show, we listed a whole bunch of different modern tooling and modern tactics for securing modern systems. And so some of the modern tooling was stuff like an API gateway, service mesh, using an IAST tool or a RASP. There's like a lot of like newer things coming out. And are there any in particular, like new cool things that you've liked, Aaron, where you're like, that's nifty. Nifty is my favorite De word this week. <laughs> Definitely. Um, you know, I'm probably only a few years away from getting my graybeard status uh, for uh, InfoSec where I again just be cold come old man yells at cloud. So like there's there's been a lot of tooling in the last three, four, five years, even that almost nothing has really impressed me, right? It's either a lot of the same things just done a little bit differently, right? But I actually mm -hmm. did look at one tool recently. Um I, I don't know if I should mention the name of the tool. I don't know if, if I want to give it a bunch of press. If so if you think it's cool, tool, if you like yeah. it, just don't mention it if you're going to trash it. How about that? No. So the company is called the Piro. It's mm -hmm. like A-P-I-I-R-O. Uh, let me look it up to make sure I'm not butchering that name. Like that? Yeah. A-P-I-I-R-O. Oh. <laughs> they do application risk management. Okay. And um, essentially what it does is they will, um, you can either have an on-prem tool, on-premise tool, or they have a cloud tool. And what you do is you hook in all the various kind of CI CD tools that you have in, uh, available. So you can hook in your GitHub, you can hook in mm -hmm. your um, security tooling, security sc uh, scanning, but you can also hook in like uh, Jira, and what it'll mm -hmm. do is it'll actually go through all these tools and actually do kind of like semantic scanning to actually try to build risk profiles based on the con like the confluence of all this information. So it can oh, basically cool. find things like, oh, it looks like you, this set of repositories is part of this one project. And this one product uses these sets of like dangerous libraries and these keywords like login, mm -hmm. auth, session, and it can actually risk profile everything for you on the fly uh, based mm -hmm. on not only uh, 
terms in the code, but also terms that are given in other tools like ticketing. So you can basically have it so you can have Jira tickets of people explaining things about a project, saying like, you know, keywords about mm -hmm. uh, like a piece of code and it'll take that into consideration for risk profiles and it can, it can build out a whole risk profile of like anything you put into it. And the really cool thing about it is that you can then build workflows that can actually create mm -hmm. triggers. So you can have a workflow that says like this project, if it sees a, a risky material change go into it that is mentioning OAuth or not mentioning OAuth, then create a Slack message to warn you. Oh, so cool. It kind of goes beyond the idea of like, you have to do like hardcore scanning and finding vulnerabilities. Yeah. It's more, I guess more human in that way, where it's like yeah. allowing you to say like, you know what, these things look kind of, eh, you should probably look into it based on what people could be actually saying and what they're actually writing as part of the code. That's really cool. I haven't heard of that before. That's awesome. So I obviously I I'm going to be off like Googling about that later. Uh, there are like, at least one of them. Really I'm cool. sure I think it's a new space. And that's why it's interesting to me because it's kind of a new, mm -hmm. a newer space in the InfoSec. Um, so there may be, you know, competitors to this already. I'm not sure, but they're the For first sure. ones that I've seen that does this. The other cool thing is yeah. that they can also build profiles on people's activity. So if they see developers doing like they'll see like when developers are working and what they're contributing to. But if then that sees like, oh, suddenly they're contributing to this other project they've never worked on, or if they're really junior and they're making risky changes, or if they see a developer making changes like on a Saturday night, they never work on. Like it can also yeah. flag like weird patterns in uh, behavior. That's awesome. Okay, well, I have to look at that. That's very cool. I. I really like, I've seen some basically like IDE plugins. So the IDE, just to repeat for everyone, is the thing where the programmers program in all day. And like plugins, you know, to tell you your API definition is incomplete or plugins that are like a spell checker that tell you like, listen, that's a really old function. We don't want you to use that anymore. Use this instead. Or like, it looks like you're not validating this input. Like, does that seem like a good idea? I like the idea of, having help as I'm doing the thing, right? I, I think that's really cool. And something that's not that new, but that I'm seeing like a lot more companies do is, so I see a, like a lot of companies where they have scans and they're in f folders and shared drives all over the network. Mm. I'm like, what if you took all of that and put it into something, right? Like it could be like thread fix, defect dojo, zero north, cloud defense sort of thing. Mm right? Like that you put it into, or it could be Excel. It could be Power BI. If you're like, I have really good Excel foo. And, and like, look at metrics and trends and look at like what you could do better over time and like set goals and then measure progress towards those goals. Like I see a lot of companies where they're scanning all the things and they have a million scans, but no one's following up so that stuff gets fixed. Or Aaron, I worked somewhere at least one place where the dev just went in and marked everything as fixed because he just didn't have time and he was just really stressed. And so I was like, wow, oh, this one project, they like, everything's good. I'm like, I got to go visit them and ask them how they did that. Because that's because I honestly, Aaron, I was like hoping that it was like amazing news, but it was it was not it was bad news. And they just mm. marked it fixed. So I would go away. And I was like, that's oh, like no. the worst news. <laughs> it's the worst news. Yeah. But I was like, I got to see what this team's doing that's better than all the rest of the teams. Sometimes, though, it is like just this team is um, like using more modern tech or they're more security aware because their manager sent them on a bunch of training or something. Or for whatever reason, like certain teams are just doing more awesome than other teams. And sometimes it's just that they have better morale or their manager yeah. really cares about security or whatever the thing is. It's like, I want to know what your magic is that that's going so well and how I can like try hard to replicate it with some other teams. Like I, I like data. And so there's like more tools and more interoperability between the tools. Like when I first started, none of the tools would ever talk to each other. 
and you were a jerk if you tried. And now some of the tools are like, yes, we do want you to plug us into the, because we understand we're part of an ecosystem and we provide more value if our stuff will go into your cloud dashboard or whatever it is where you're going to look at this. And I think that's pretty cool. There is a comment in the chat and it is uh, that they, uh, Kellen was saying he's added a Puro to his list of things to check out. Yeah, me too, Kellen. That's awesome. So we have two more questions. And the next one is one that you've kind of already answered. Which modern type of tactic sounds most interesting to you? And so we already talked about paved roads, but some of the other tactics were, <clears throat> it's like skipping through here because I can't memorize my whole book despite trying. Um, <clears throat> we're like self-service everything. It's not even on the page I looked. <laughs> um, self-service everything and there we go you can just like start if you want to Aaron uh yeah again I, I just had to kind of look at like what are the what are some of the security unicorns I'd like to try to you know find and ride and one of the things that I really would love to see more of that we, uh, I think, I don't know why this hasn't been done more in the past, is more security unit testing. So actually having written yeah. unit tests that are part of the actual code base that are ran during the, uh, the build process that actually check for security issues, right? Because generally those are only, yeah. most, <clears throat> the majority of unit testing is only checking for is the uh, application perf uh, performing as designed, right? But the problem with security issues is that security issues can crop up even if it's running as designed, you know, because maybe the design is bad or maybe the de it, uh, like, or it, it, it's doing you know, all the things it's supposed to do, but it's also doing a bunch of stuff that it is not supposed to do. Yeah. So, and if it, that it's completely possible to do that to actually write a unit test saying, you know, oh, yeah. if I have um, if I take in uh, data into a, a request object, what does the response object look like? You know, when it comes yeah. to what the data looks like, does it look like if I put in HTML characters, does it come out as HTML characters? That tells me that mm -hmm. there's possibly an XSS issue. And say, are you trying to access this object with this incorrect ID number, do I get the object's data back? You know, if I, if I get it back, that means that there's possibly an authorization issue there. Completely within reason to write these tests, but it just, it's never become part of, again, I think it's a culture thing. I think a lot of people don't put that into the category of thinking of doing that. And, and they think that, you know, QA might be able to do a lot of this stuff because that's kind of their job is to kind of weed out some of these issues that may also not be caught by automated testing, but QA classically is doing a lot of the same stuff as they're looking to make sure that the design and especially the business logic is working as correctly. But as I've mentioned is that design could be working correctly, business logic could be working correctly, but there could still be a lot of security issues. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of testing you can do on top of that when it comes to the acceptance stage, when it comes to the SDLC and the acceptance stage being integration testing, smoke testing and unit testing right and getting more security into that space to actually find things in an automated fashion i totally agree and that's totally one of the things in the book i a thing that i've i've heard of a bit recently from uh clint gibbler so he's a friend of mine he has a newsletter called too long didn't read sec and um he talks about searching for anti-patterns. So mm -hmm. use like, let's say you set out a secure code guideline. So let's say everyone programs Java and you all use Spring Boot. And so your secure coding guideline says, you know, you're gonna output in code like this. You're gonna validate inputs like that. You're gonna use parameterized queries like so. And then um, he did this workshop where then he searched for like, basically grepped through using something called SEM grep, mm -hmm. where he basically like he would search for, okay, so if you're supposed to be inputting things like this, what doesn't look like that and who's doing it? 
And then you could just look through a giant code base really quickly and you have to know what to look for and that takes time. And that's totally cool. Oh, I'm just going to share Clint's super awesome newsletter, which is free and everyone ever should sign up for. That's tldrsec.com. But basically, I like it hadn't occurred to me to do that before. So I will do stuff like search for secrets through an entire code base and find tons of them, get everyone to fix that. And then from then on, when people are checking stuff in, have it scan to see if it looks like there's a secret. So is there a hash? Is there a password, a connection string, a key to something that's in the code instead of being in a secret management tool where it should be, right? But that's yeah. an anti-pattern, right? And it didn't occur to me like, oh, that's a like it's a pattern of stuff that should not be. And so him explaining in this workshop like, oh, but this is also an anti-pattern. That's also, I was like, oh my gosh breaking my brain, Clint, and just being able to, so grep is like a Unix command to search through things very, very quickly using regular expressions. And so they've made their own language, which is totally fine. But the idea that you could just look through really, really quickly and like immediately find things that are wrong and not acceptable for your org, I was like, well, that's pretty attractive. That's pretty cool. But I think you would need a, a person that really knows code to do a good job at that. Like you couldn't put that into like the average, um, maybe like security person who wasn't a dev for, you know, 10 years before they switched to security, like they're come from infrastructure, sysadmin or something. If you put a tool like that in their hands, they're probably like, uh, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I, I love SEMGREP. I've used it multiple times, but yeah, you do have to write the rules uh, to have it search for whatever you're looking at. You're basically to search for those anti-patterns. So you do have yeah. to get an idea of like what the code is supposed to look like and then know what it's not supposed to look like as well. So you still have to at least have a developer's mindset to really understand that. But SemGraph is awesome because it's super fast and it's really easy to define those rules as well. Because yeah. I've used yeah, some they have a static community, analysis tools. Right? Don't, yeah. don't they, they have, have a community, community where they're sharing? Yeah, they have a community and a registry of already prepackaged tools that you can call just via its command line. And then, uh, and I was going to mention, like I've I've done t uh, editing rules in other tools like Fortify, which is a complete nightmare. And I don't care. I'm throwing Fortify under the bus. Sorry, not sorry, not sorry. But trying to work <laughs> in in uh, Fortify's XML ruling was probably one of the worst things I've had to do in the last few years. Yeah. No comment from me. Hmm. <laughs> uh, anyone listening who's not watching SEMGREP is S-E-M-G-R-E-P dot dev, like developer. Um, so we have the last question, but the question's for the audience. It's not for us, Aaron. After you've read this chapter or more, more optionally after you've heard me and Aaron chat, what do you see missing in your own organization and what could you improve and how could you do it? Some of the questions in the book are for you to think about yourself. And so I, I kind of want to send the audience home with that question. So after listening to all of this, what is missing where you work and what could you as a person do to try to improve it and go forth and conquer? I know that might sound cheesy, but I mean, like that, like everything starts with one person. Yeah. So Aaron, do you have anything that you want to promote besides like telling everyone they need to go read hellosecure.com? Uh, yeah, I mean, go uh, check out the blog. Um, again, we're going to try to get some more writing in, but it really comes down to, uh, to making sure that I am inspired to write something that I think is worth saying, right? and uh, may come down to being more opinionated pieces, which is what uh, the direction will probably go towards. But yeah, follow me on Twitter at Hell Secure. Um, I try to post regularly on there. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's not too much else going on as far as like, there's no conferences coming up for a while. And even if there are, I'm probably not going into any, like uh, probably going to DEF CON 30 next summer. That's about it. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be trying to be more involved again with uh, the WeHack Purple community and also with any other events that might be coming up as well. So, 
And, cool. and feel free to DM me on Twitter if you have questions or need advice about AppSec or getting into, into the industry or whatever you're doing currently. You know, I'm I'm always open to, to questions. Yes. Um, what do I want to promote? So I'm going to be speaking at SneakCon next week on Wednesday, and that's really cool. Um, I'm speaking at a couple of conferences. And so if you go to my newsletter, which I'm going to put here, newsletter.shehacksperple.ca. If you go there, basically, I just like tell you what's up and what's coming. And I also give you updates about how my garden's going because that's important to me. <laughs> and so if you want to join my newsletter, you can. Um, also, I'm just doing more stuff in the community for We Hack Purple. So We Hack Purple community is free. And that's at community.wehackpurple.com. And so if you want to join us, that would be cool. If you stumbled upon this stream and it is 2021, that means there's more streams. And so if you want to um, go and see, like get invites to, so there's three more streams this year. And if you want invites to them, you can go to Alice and bobwearn.com and sign up for invites. And basically we will like send you an automated email. They'll remind you to show up. And yeah, and in the, in the community, you can get invites to that too. And a lot more. Um, I believe we're get, giving away a bunch of free tickets to something this week. Bridge Crew gave us a gift. They keep giving us gifts of like big chunk of tickets to things, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I'm going to be giving away a free a ticket to Sector. So if you go to um, Sector.ca, so that's going to be the only in-person thing that I'm speaking at this year, Sector, which is in Toronto, Canada, November 3rd and 4th. I'm on the 4th. I'm going to talk about building security champions, which is my favorite thing lately. But basically, if you're in the We Hack Purple community, we're going to run some sort of contest so that you can get a ticket to come in person to Sector for free. So probably mostly people in Toronto. And then hopefully, if you want to, you'll have a coffee with me and we'll get to meet in person. And so I'm like kind of excited about that because I really love meeting community members. So that will be in the We Hack Purple community. And I think that's all the things that I'm supposed to promote unless. Oh, and the next episode of this, which. Um, is October 30th, we're gonna do chapter nine. So chapter nine is good habits. So stuff like using a password manager, checking your code in, knowing what to do during a security incident, et cetera, to keep your organization safe. And so thank you so much for coming, Aaron. Yeah, of course. I, it, was, it was a pleasure having you. And thank you to my amazing sound and video engineer, Nancy, who's totally awesome. And thank you for showing up, uh, listener, viewers, people who show up live, people who listen later or watch later. Thank you because you showing up to these things makes them worth doing. I really appreciate it. So I'm Tanya Jenka and uh, I hope to see you next month or I guess at the end of this month. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Bye.